Hello, my name is Frank Saratella, and before we get started, as always, I just want to thank Mr. DT and Discovery Idols for having me in his studio to share the Word of God with you, my audience, and I would just pray that you would uh, receive the things that uh, the Lord has been sharing with me, and that it would draw you closer and more intimate to know Jesus. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Frank Saratella, and God gave me a second chance in life. Um, medically, I should be dead, but God spared me. And you can read my whole testimony on my website called amidnightcry.com. It's all one word, amidnightcry.com. You'll find my testimony. Uh, you'll find books that I've written that are on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, but you can read them all in their entirety for free. There's no charge for anything on my website. You can go check that out. It's called amidnightcry.com. Everything that you, you'll want, uh, study helps that the Lord has brought in my path to give to you, to share so that you would be more intimate with the Lord, that you can see the Lord high and lifted up, and that you can cleanse your heart and purify your heart and repent with no regrets. With that being said, on Saturday afternoon, the Lord gave me a very specific message for today. And it's not an easy message to bring because God's heart is broken over his people. God's heart is broken over modern Christianity and the religious system. The title of today's message is, The Lord Pleads with His People, Forsake All of the Other Gods and Idols Before the Door Shuts. What's sad about this message is that multitudes of Christians are going to be slaughtered by the Lord Himself because of their rebellion to the Word of God. It's not by a coincidence that in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, the Lord sends Isaiah to his own people. And what's interesting about Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, is that the Lord tells Isaiah that Go and tell these people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not know. Make the heart of this people fat, their ears heavy, shut their eyes, unless they see with their eyes, and they hear with their ears, and they understand with their heart, and repent so that I can heal them. Start all over? Or no, you can go ahead. Okay. Sorry, just a technical difficulty. What's interesting about the verse in Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, is that verse is repeated in every one of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, but then that verse is also repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and then Romans. You can look them up on, on your own time to see. But I believe that the reason the Lord repeated it is because just like in the Old Testament is exactly the way it is today. The arrogance and the pride of modern Christianity has caused people to have eyes, but they don't see, ears, but they don't hear, and their hearts have become arrogant and fat, and they do not receive the revelation that God wants to give us. Humility will always bring healing. It is a scriptural Doctrine found from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. When we are humble, God will hear us. 
God will help us and God will heal us. But if we are wise in our own eyes, God sees us from afar because God looks down upon the proud and he resists the proud, but God gives grace and healing to those that are humble. In humility comes true repentance, and repentance means change. Stop the old way and start anew. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul in chapter 13, verses 40 and 41, directs the New Testament church to look back to the prophets. And he says this. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets will come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, marvel and perish. For I, the Lord, work a work in your days, a work which will by no means believe, you will no means believe, though someone were to declare it to you. So the Lord is giving us a warning. And the warning is that God is going to do something that is going to be completely unprecedented. And that's why God's heart is broken now. Is that multitudes of Christians know something is coming but they're not prepared for it. What has happened is multitudes of Christians are more worried about sharing and talking about Jesus than being with Jesus and getting to know Jesus in an intimate way so that the eyes that are too pure to look at fire, the eyes that burn as a flame of fire, he whose countenance is like the sun, people flee from and it's just like it says in John and this is the condemnation that men hate the light and they hate the light because their deeds are, their deeds are evil and unless you and I put it in our hearts that we are going to be in the presence of God and let God break us down so that we can repent with no regrets multitudes of Christians are going to die and go to hell because of idols in their heart that they're not aware of. The Word of God talks about the secret sins of the heart. Well, how can we see the secret sins of the heart unless we're in the presence of a holy God so that God himself can expose the vileness, the rebellion, the pride, the lust, the anger, all of the ungodliness that the fallen human nature of man has. And that's why the Lord is calling to his people. He's calling to his people to turn to him. And the Lord is pleading with his people, just like he did in Micah, saying, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? How have I tired you out? Answer me. The Lord is calling us to rest in him, to sit at his feet and hear his words. God is not interested in what we do for him. God is not interested in what we build for him. God is only interested that we hear his words and obey his words, that we would walk with him in holiness and in purity of heart, that we would reflect the love, the humility, and the compassion of his son Jesus. And just like the Lord pleaded with the people, his people, in Jeremiah's day, the Lord does the same today. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me? That they have gone far from me. They have, they have followed idols, and they have become idolaters. They never asked themselves, where is the Lord who brought us out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits, through the land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and that no one dwelt. I, the Lord, brought you into a bountiful country to eat 
its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered my land, you defiled it, and you made my heritage an abomination. The priests, the leadership, they never asked themselves, where is the Lord? And those that handle the law, those that handle the word of God, they did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. As it was then, is exactly as it is today. And I know the last couple of weeks I've been sharing a lot out of Ezekiel, but the Lord just won't release me to get out of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is so important for today because in Ezekiel chapter 8, let's read verses 3, 4, and 5, and 6. And we're going to correlate it with today. We'll start at chapter 8, verse 3. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me between earth and heaven and brought me into the visions of, of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes to, idol, to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I had saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now towards the north. So I lifted my eyes towards the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was this idol of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, the Lord said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the great abominations that the house of Israel practices here to make me go far from my sanctuary? Now turn again, and you will see greater abominations. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the reason that the presence of a holy God is not with us and around us is because we continue to practice the abominations of the sins of the flesh. And God is calling us to turn from those things. God is calling us to stop the idol worship, to stop serving other gods and other idols in our life. Whatever or whoever controls your life is your God, is your idol. A God is someone or something that controls you, possesses you. You, revol you revolve your life around it. It could be a wife, a husband, your children. It could be your job. It could be a career. It could be a hobby. Anything that you spend more time with than you do with Jesus is an idol. Now, it doesn't mean we have to quit our jobs to be with the Lord, because if the Lord wants you to quit his job, if the Lord wants you to quit your job, he'll let you quit your job so that you can spend your time in the word, as he's done with me. But whatever controls your life is your God. And what's really sad since I've been down here five years next month in West Palm Beach is the amount of people that I've talked to where their life revolves around their church or their Bible study or their ministry. And what has happened is it has become their idol. I had the experience not long ago where I had developed a pretty good relationship with a, a pastor and he came in one Friday night and he was very upset and I said what seems to be the problem And he says you know I did this Bible study tonight and everything I said just went right over their heads they don't get it they didn't they weren't paying attention to me they didn't ask me any questions I just feel like I'm preaching to the wall, and I'm teaching people that really don't want to know what God has to say. And he and I had been talking previously to this, and I told him, the Lord is trying to get you out of the ministry to be alone with him. And his response was always the same, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. But this night was different, because he actually saw that the people that he was teaching did not have a heart for God nor were they interested in the things of God. 
but the Bible study had become a religious social club. We entered that conversation that night, and he said, you know, I'm going to get along with the Lord, and I'm, I'm, I really think it's time I need to walk away. I got, I got to get out. I got to be alone with God. And I thought that was very encouraging. And the following week, he came in, and I said, so how are things going between you and Jesus? And he says, well, the Lord kept me, the Lord's kept me doing the Bible study. And I looked at him, I said, why would the Lord have you do that? He goes, well, he wants me to finish what I've already started. And I looked at him, and I said, that's not from God. He said, no, 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 really, it is, I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be fine. My heart broke that night. And from that night until now, he doesn't return phone calls, doesn't stop by and say hello, doesn't stop by to visit. His ministry had become his idol. And he's not the first. The Lord has allowed me to talk and share the word of God with many people in leadership. And they see the hypocrisy in it. They see that something's wrong. And yet they will not give up their ministry to be alone with God. And unless the Lord opens their eyes to see and the Lord opens their ears to hear and they turn and repent, these people will die and go to hell. And they'll not understand. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, what ends up happening is is that your idol, whatever it may be, your church, your Bible study, your ministry, your website, your name, your reputation, whatever idol that you have, if you will not give that up, God himself will send you strong delusion. Let's look at the word of God to see where the Lord pleads with his people and see, what you have to understand is this, thank you, Lord, is that God gives us the definition of idolatry in 1 Samuel 15. When Samuel is rebellious to the word, I'm sorry, Saul is rebellious to the word that Samuel has given him. And listen to what the Lord says through Samuel. Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. Then Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness, is the sin of idolatry. If you're not willing to give up your life, you will lose it. Because you reject the word of the Lord, the Lord God has rejected you from being king. When you reject giving up your ministry, your church, your religion, your denomination, your life for Jesus, you are now serving other gods and other idols. And the Lord God, whose name is Jealous, who is a consuming fire, doesn't ask. He demands us to give us, to give him our whole heart. It's a fair trade-off. The Lord God, who sits in the heavens, that sits between the cherubim, whose name is Holy, who is a jealous God, he sits there and he has given us his entire life, his entire love, his entire soul, his entire being into his son, his beloved precious son, Jesus, so that we could be forgiven of our sins to get the power to overcome those sins and to have sweet fellowship with a holy, loving God. And to spend eternity walking and talking and worshiping the God who created us. 
But if you're not willing to give up your life for Jesus as Jesus has given up his life for you, you're not worthy just like I'm not worthy to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. For whoever so save his life will lose it. But if you lose your, your life for my sake in the gospel, you will find it. Those are the words of Jesus. And it is exactly what happened in the Old Testament is happening exactly today. Christians in multitudes are playing the harlot. And what's interesting is, is the word harlot first makes its appearance in Exodus chapter 34. And let me let me qualify that. It makes its first appearance regarding the people of God as playing the harlot. The word harlot is used in, in Genesis. But now we're looking at the word harlot in regards to God's people. And what's interesting is, is that in Exodus chapter 34, 14, it says, You shall have no other gods before you, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. That's Exodus 34, 14. But let's look at Exodus 34, 15 and 16. Verse 15, Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you and you eat his sacrifice. And you take of his sons and his daughters and his daughters and you play the heart, you play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no idol for yourself. You see, that was in Exodus 34. In Exodus 32, God's people had manipulated Aaron, and because of Aaron's fear of the people, he listened to the people, and he didn't fear God, and he built a gold calf, an idol. And the people of God in the Old Testament just like the people, Christians today of God, in the New Testament have built idols. And they eat and they drink and they get up to play. And they sing and they dance around their idol. And they become like the world. God had specifically told his people, do not intermingle with the nations around you. Because I know the propensity, I know the inclination of your heart and that your heart is weak and that you will turn and serve other gods and other idols, thus playing the harlot from me. He talks about that in Numbers chapter 15 when he says, he's talking about the tassels of the garments of the priesthood, 15, 39, 40, and 41, and you shall have the tassel, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you remember to do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I, the Lord, I am the Lord your God. Ladies and gentlemen, God has always wanted us for himself to be a special treasure, that he would be our God and that we would be his children to walk in covenant with him. But what has happened today, just like in the, the days of the Old Testament, Prophet Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. The children of God played the harlot, worshiping other gods and other idols and acting just like the nations around them. What's interesting is that in Ezekiel, the word idol is mentioned in Ezekiel more than any other, word, any other book in the Bible. 
The word idol is mentioned 44 times, and the word harlot 38 times. Is there a correlation between serving other gods and other idols and being a harlot? Absolutely. Because when we worship other gods and other idols, we are not being faithful to Jesus. We are worshiping him with our lips, but our heart is far away. And that's why in the book of the Revelation, the Lord talks about the great harlot. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth, Revelation chapter 17. That's why Babylon is the whole religious system, because it doesn't teach people to be faithful to Jesus. It teaches people that you can have idols in your heart and you can worship God. The whole religious system does not teach people how to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after Jesus. The whole religious system does not teach people how to die to self and walk in covenant with God. The whole religious system, all of it, is a dwelling place of demons. And God is calling us to come out of it and be separate. To come out into the wilderness that he would contend with us and show us our hearts so that we can repent with no regrets. So that we could understand the holiness of God and the jealousy of God and the love of God. The problem is today... In modern Christianity, people behind pulpits in leadership have cultivated a God in the image and likeness of man, just like it says in Romans 1, but not in the image and likeness of the Old Testament and the New Testament. God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God demands fear reverence, respect. You don't see that in modern Christianity anymore. You don't see people trembling at the word of God. They eat, they drink, and they go out to play. Churches have become a social club. Churches have become a business. Bible studies Instead of going clubbing on a Friday night, you can go to a Bible study on a Wednesday or Friday night. Let it take the place. And what's sad is many Bible studies are dictated by outlines that are given to people in that leadership so that people can stay along party lines, so to speak. Instead of opening the Word of God and asking the Lord to grant revelation, it's sad when I am invited to a Bible study, and I hear people say, well, I, mean, I think it means this, and I think it means that, and I think it means this, and I think it means that, which means that they're not getting revelation, and they really don't know what the Word of God means. And ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me closely. If you're hearing any person teaching the Word of God, and they use the word, I believe, and I think, that means it's a private interpretation, and it's it is intellect that they are sharing with people, not revelation. Because when a person receives revelation from the Word of God, they know confidently what they speak, what they teach, and what they know because God himself has opened the heavens and poured forth his revelation into their heart and mind so that they may be able to share fresh manna with people so that people can feed off of the bread of life that God has given that person, so that people can drink freely of the waters of life, that they may be refreshed in their souls. But when you hear people say, I believe and I think this, run far away, because they're teaching you another, another gospel with another Jesus, and they're giving you demon spirits. It's interesting because, like I said, Ezekiel talks about the word idol 44 times, and Ezekiel is predominantly a book about the judgment of God on his own people because of their idolatry and because of their harlotry, not being faithful to God. The 
The word idol is used 121 times in the Word of God. 17 times it's used in the New Testament. And you know what's really interesting? I have never heard anybody talk about idol worship in New Testament churches in modern Christianity. Their concept of idol worship is pretty much Catholicism and the statues that they built. But what's really interesting is if you go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, the Apostle John, speaking to the New Testament church, says this, Little children, protect yourself from idols. Amen. Some translations say keep, others say protect, guard. It's all the same Greek word. It means to protect yourself, guard yourself. So what was the Apostle John warning the New Testament church about? What kind of, what kind of idols was John talking about? Well, if we go to the book of Colossians, the beloved Apostle Paul writes, in chapter 3, let's take a look at the idols that Paul was talking about. Chapter 3, we'll start at verse 2. Set your mind on things above and not on things on earth. For you, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death the members of your flesh that are here on earth, your earthly nature. Put to death your earthly nature, your fleshly nature. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion or lust, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the children of, is coming upon the sons of disobedience. If you are not putting to death the deeds of the flesh, the wrath of God abides on you. And that's John chapter 3, verse 36 in the New American Standard Version. It translates it perfectly. You see, Paul knew the requirements of God and the requirements of the covenant of God. And that's why he warned the New Testament church over and over again to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Because the flesh is an enemy against God. In Colossians chapter 3 goes perfectly with Ephesians chapter 5. That says, chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us, and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all, clean, all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. Verse 5. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetousness, covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance of the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Interesting. Colossians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 5. Talk about if you are in rebellion to God, his wrath abides on you. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And what is the wrath of God? The wrath of God are the demon spirits that God himself will send to correct us in his love, to get us on the right path. And if you don't believe me, let's look at Psalm 78, verse 49. And it says this, The Lord cast on them the fierceness of his anger, his wrath, his indignation, and trouble. Notice what, he, what it says here. The Lord cast on them, his people, the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending angels of destruction, evil angels, among them. 
which goes along with Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 15, and you will see that when Saul was disobedient to the commands of God, you will see in 1 Samuel, chapter 16, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said to him, Surely a evil spirit from God is troubling you. Those are verses 14 and 15 in chapter 16. In verse 16, Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that he will play with his hand when the evil spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. You see, in modern Christianity, they won't talk about the demons that God will send because they don't want to talk about the discipline that God has to give us if we truly love him because he truly loves us. And the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 12 that if you are without discipline, God makes it very, very, very clear. Let's look at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Do you see that? Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure discipline, God deals with you as a son. For what son is there who father does not discipline but if you are without discipline without chastening of which you become partakers then you are a bastard you are illegitimate and not sons i speak to parents out there if you have children and they're being disobedient or they're going in a way that you know is going to cause them destruction you do whatever it takes to get them to protect them to watch over them. And what has happened in modern Christianity and churches all over the world is they are ignoring the discipline and the correction of a loving, holy God to get us on the right path. Because the fact of the matter is, is that if we do not have pure hearts, we don't get to see God. You can do all the wonderful things. You can have your ministry. You can have your websites. You can have your internet. You can have your outer net, you can have Bible studies, you can have all sorts of wonderful religious things. But if you've not spent intimate time and seeking the Lord and asking the Lord, Lord, tell me and show me what all I must give up for you so that I may love you and be with you. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God's not interested in what we do for him. He's interested in us being with him and walking with him, and talking with him. If God wants something done, he'll let us know. We don't have to take it upon ourselves. That's the problem with modern Christianity today is people all over are making an intellectual decision that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He died for my sins. And right away they want to go out and they want to share what they think is the gospel. They don't even know what the gospel is, but they are sharing church doctrines. And they are proselytizing people to come to their churches and to come to their Bible studies and come to our fellowship groups. And what you have is the blind leading the blind. And as it says in Isaiah 5, with much joy they descend into the pit. And God's heart's broken. His heart is broken because all day long he stretches forth his hand to a rebellious and stubborn people. And he says, this is the way, walk ye in it. But people would rather spend time doing things with Jesus, doing things for Jesus than spending time with Jesus. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. 
If you cannot be content with Jesus now, how will you be content with him later? And you see, this is all part of the covenant. When God made covenant with Abraham, because now we, you and me, we are descendants of Abraham. He is our father. We come from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's our forefather. And God established the covenant with Abraham, and then with Isaac, and then with Jacob, and then he manifested it even greater to the children of Israel. And we've talked about that. We, we, we may touch upon that again. But listen to what the Lord says about his covenant, his covenant that he makes with you and me. Genesis chapter 17, and if you read Genesis chapter 17, 1 through 14, you will see that the Lord talks about making covenant. And it says in verse 10 and 11, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Well, what does he mean, circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins? What he's talking about today in the New Testament is putting off the flesh nature, as he talks about in Galatians chapter 5, when he talks about, those that belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. When we walk with Jesus, Jesus commands us that if we are going to follow him, Luke 9, 23 through 25, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will find it. You see... Our responsibility in walking in covenant to God is to deny ourselves of the manifestation of the flesh nature. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 to have the mind of Christ. And 1 Peter talks about also having the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is denying yourself and taking up your cross. The reason Jesus was able to go to the cross after the Garden of Gethsemane was because he had gone to the cross every day of his ministry. It was never his will, but the will of the Father, as he says in John, I do only those things that please the Father. He laid down his life habitually to do those things that would please the Father. And you see, what's happened today in modern Christianity is we have multitudes of people talking about Jesus, teaching about Jesus, but they're not living like Jesus. They're not living in love, humility, and compassion. They're living like the world, and the Word of God says in James 4, 4, if you're a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. And if you're a friend of the world, that means you're not putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Because First Peter says that if we have the mind of Jesus, we suffer in the flesh to give up sin. And you see, that's the gospel. The gospel is that when you are tempted, just like Jesus was, and this is the beautiful part of Hebrews. I had a conversation with a pastor of a very big church, that told me that the book of Hebrews was not for modern, for Christian for Christians today. And I looked at him, I said, how do, you, how do you justify that? And he said, that was for the Hebrews then. I said, well, wait a minute. Aren't we Hebrews? And he looked at me with this funny look on his face. He said, well, according to Romans chapter 2, we become Jews inwardly because now we're circumcised by the Spirit. And he got very angry at me, yelled at me, and then left. But you see... That's the whole core of the book of Hebrews, is that we can become sons of God just like Jesus is. That's why he says in Hebrews, let's, let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. 
But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he might, by the grace of God, taste death for everyone. Verse 10, For it was fitting for Jesus, for by whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. When we suffer and we give up flesh, we are pleasing God and we are becoming conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. Verse 14, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Jesus was in flesh and blood. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. What kind of death? The death on the cross. And that is the death that we do is that when we are tempted to get angry, we suffer and we come with confidence to the throne of grace and mercy, Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, and we ask for grace and mercy so that we can suffer and not give in to anger, but to manifest love and humility and compassion towards our enemies so that people see Jesus, they hear Jesus, and they receive, they receive a reflection of the love of God in us, being like Jesus. That is having the heart of Jesus, walking, talking, thinking, being an epistle read and, over, read and known by all men that they see Jesus in us, the Christ, the hope of glory, Christ in us, the hope of glory. In Hebrews chapter 5, Verse 2 it says, Jesus can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself also was beset by those weaknesses. See, he had the same weakness as we did. That's the beauty that God had in his redemptive plan of, of bringing us back to himself, is that he sent Jesus that was in all points tempted just like we are, so that he knows so that when we come to him in humility saying, Lord, help me, teach me, show me, he will give us grace and mercy so that we can overcome our sin. Verse 8, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Now let's, let's go, let's start at verse 7. Who in the days of Jesus' flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears, who was able to save him from death, was heard because of his godly fear. How was he saved from death? Because he died. He's talking about saved from sin because sin is death in God's eyes. When Jesus cried out to the Father, Abba, Father, the Father granted him grace and mercy so that he would overcome sin. And he will do the same. That's why in verse 8 it says, Though he was a son, Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. When we are obedient to the word of God and we suffer in the flesh to cease from sin, God promotes us. And we now are reflecting Jesus in our life. When Paul says, I die daily in 1 Corinthians, what is he talking about? It means that every time he is confronted by sin, he suffers and gives up sin so that he can manifest Jesus because he loved Jesus more than his sin. That's why it says in Romans chapter 8, he says, verse 18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to... Now listen to this closely. Please listen to this closely and look it up and read it for yourselves and get the revelation for yourselves. Verse 18, chapter 8, Romans 18 and 19. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you get that? The glory revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of Creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's going to be us. When we suffer in the flesh and give up sin, the glory of God is manifested and people see the light. They see that we don't walk, talk, or act like this world. We don't think 
like the world. We are manifesting heaven here on earth and walking in a divine nature. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory, is that you can show the world how to live a heavenly life here on earth. That's why the Apostle Peter talks about the divine nature. Paul talks about the divine nature. That is where the Lord is calling us to, is to walk in the divine nature. Why do you think it says in Romans chapter 8 again? We'll start at verse 35. For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As, as it is written, for your sake we are, are you ready? We are being put to death all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. What does that mean? It means that when somebody strikes our right cheek, we give them the left. When somebody persecutes us and reviles us, we bless them and we love them. When somebody curses us, we love them more. When somebody cuts us off, we are patiently just loving them. That's manifesting Jesus. Verse 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Jesus who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things come to come nor height nor depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's so true. Nothing can separate us except, except there's one thing that will separate us. Are you ready? That one thing that will separate us is found in... In Isaiah, are you ready? Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, verse 1 through 3. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your sins have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity and your lips have spoken lies and your tongue has muttered perversity. Do you want to know why your prayers are not being answered? Do you want to know why you're living in sickness and disease, oppression, depression? It's because of sin. Unrepented, not turned away, overcome sin. You see, that's the whole core of grace. Grace is the strength and the power of the gospel. Grace is the power that God gives us to overcome all sin. Grace is that vehicle, that tool that God gives us, that in our time of weakness, we can call on a holy, loving God, and he will give us the power to manifest his son. Because that's what being a Christian is. Being a Christian is being like Christ. The disciples, because they walked like Jesus and they talked like Jesus and they loved like Jesus and were humble like Jesus, the disciples were called Christians in Antioch, Acts chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul to the church says, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my weaknesses that the power of Jesus may rest upon me. And because of this, therefore, I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in reproaches, and in, in, in needs and in persecutions, and his stresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then he is strong in the grace of God. And God is manifesting his glory through the Apostle Paul, through you, through I, for all of us who will give up our lives and walk in the instruction of grace. Because the instruction of grace, and see, that's exactly the problem today in modern Christianity, is they're not teaching all about grace. Grace has... Ten 
different characteristics. That's why the Apostle Peter talks about, in 1 Peter, the manifold grace of God, that you be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, the manifold grace of God. And what does the word manifold mean? It means a whole having many different parts. And if you go on my website of midnightcry.com, you will find there's 10 parts of grace. And what you will find when you read in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, let's read it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Verse 12, teaching us. So we see that grace teaches us. The grace of God teaches us denying ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So if we are not living seriously or soberly and righteously in, and godly in the, right, in, in the present age, we are doing exactly what the Apostle Paul warned the church in Corinth, receiving the grace of God in vain. That's why the Apostle Paul pleaded with the children, pleaded with the church, pleaded with the people in Corinth. Stating, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Let me see if I can find that so that you can read it for yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with Jesus, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, when we call on the, we call on the name of the Lord, the Lord will give us grace to overcome. And we can walk in that grace and manifest his life and his love. And then people see the difference between true Christianity and hypocrisy. <clears throat> the sad part of this message is this. Those people that hear this message and those people who reject this message and reject the truth of the gospel will be those people that are slaughtered by the hand of God. Those people that reject the grace of God, trample under their feet the Son of God, and they regard the blood that Jesus shed is a common thing. And they go on sinning in their willful ways, living life the way they choose, instead of denying themselves and taking up their cross. And God, who all day long stretches forth his hand, saying, this is the way, walk there in it, keeps pleading with his people, Return, O backsliding Israel, return. I am married to you, saith the Lord. Come back, O faithless one, and I will heal your backslidings. But if you continue to hold on to your other gods and your idols, your pride, your lust, your anger, your resentment, your unforgiveness, God has no choice. to bring a great slaughter on the hypocrisy and the people that have not manifested the glory of God. The word of God is very clear in Ephesians that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. That is a church that has pure hearts, a church that is walking in covenant with him. And in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23, Jesus said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men proceed. Now listen to the order in which Jesus, the Son of God, gives us 
about the condition of the heart of man. For out of man, what defiles a man comes from within. For out of the heart of men, number one, proceeds evil thoughts. Oh, you may not look at that woman with lust, but if you're playing that movie, God's watching your thoughts. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. And that's why the Lord says in Ezekiel chapter 14, I believe it is, or maybe it's 20. Or maybe it's chapter 8. I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 11. He says, I know the things that come into your mind, says the Lord. If we're not taking captive thoughts, ungodly thoughts, then we're just being rebellious to God. That's why the Lord tells us to meditate on his word day and night. That's number one, proceeds evil thoughts. Number two, adulteries. It's not just physical adultery, it's the spiritual adultery. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. That's why James says you adulterer, you whore, you harlot. All through God's word, he commands us to be separated from the world. Not that we're going to be out of the world, because we're in the world. We're just not supposed to be partaking of the world. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile a man. And you see, when we truly love Jesus with our whole heart, we will overcome all of those things. Because he's given us his word, he's given us his spirit, he's given us his grace, he's given us his blood. He's given us the covenant that he would be our God and that we would be his children. All we have to do is submit. That is why Jesus tells Seven times he tells us in the book of the Revelation, you can look it for yourself to overcome. He wouldn't tell us to overcome if he didn't give us the power to overcome. But if churches and Bible studies and people are not teaching you how to overcome and how to get rid of your sin, you'll stand before God and die and go to hell because you didn't overcome your sin. Your sin was an idol. You loved practicing sin more than you loved Jesus. Why do you think the Apostle Paul in Romans 6 says, Do you not know that to whoever you yield yourself to obey, that is the slave of who you become? Either you become a slave of sin or you become a slave of righteousness? That's why the Apostle Paul says, Shall we then continue in sin? No. Because we have died if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. What is the likeness of his death? We deny ourselves and take up our cross. We crucify the flesh with its passions and its desire. We do not give in to pride. We do not give in to lust. We do not give in to covetousness. We don't give in to the ungodly hypocrisy of the world. But we manifest Jesus. That's what Romans 6 is all about. We do not have to live in sin. Why do you think the Apostle Paul says, do not let sin reign. Do not let it have command over you in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lust. See, that's the whole problem is people are walking around and they're just doing. You cannot tell in multitudes of Christians pre-salvation and after and post-salvation because there's no change. Oh, they may be going to a Bible study. They may be telling people about Jesus. But when you look at them, what's the difference? Do you see the love and the humility of Jesus in them? Do you see the compassion in Jesus in them? No. People get cut off and right away they're yelling and screaming. People are in line and they're, they're fussing and, oh, this is ridiculous and I shouldn't be this. 
where's the compassion? Somebody makes a mistake and right away they want their piece of flesh. I always listen. Why not have compassion? You don't know what those people are going through. Ladies and gentlemen, God, in his mercy, in his love for mankind, is giving us a warning. And the warning is this. Walk away from everything. Put away your ministry. Put away your Bible studies. Put away all of it and be alone with him. And walk with him and talk with him. And learn how to know him. That you can walk in covenant with him. The days that are coming very shortly are going to be very, very dark days. And if you do not know the great shepherd, if you cannot live with the experience that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And though one fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, it shall not come near me. If you do not know that experience where you know that God is your God and that you are his son and that he, your daughter and that you are walking in covenant and God is going to watch over you. If you do not know that, you will be slaughtered. Because just like it was in the days of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 12, when God sent the death angel, and that death angel this time is going to be Jesus with a slaughter as he sharpens his sword. And how is it that the children of Israel escaped the slaughter of God in the Old Testament? Is that he saw the blood over the doorpost. And all repented sin will have the blood covering it. But if your sin is not repented of and overcome, you will be slaughtered. I've been given the notice that it's time to leave. And on that, ladies and gentlemen, seek the Lord while he may be found. Give up your idols. Stop serving other gods and idols. Give it all up to Jesus because very shortly, none of it is going to matter. Thank you and good night.